two uh, two part sessions. So after uh, Stan's uh, uh, talk, uh, we'll have a Q and A session, and then after uh, after that we'll take a short break, and then uh, Hendrik will do his uh, presentation on uh, ways of uh, collecting uh, uh, resources, uh, searching, and, and so on. Uh, so and after that, I will quickly and uh, briefly go through some of the logistical uh, issues uh, uh, concerning uh, M2, because uh, Stan is uh, tight on time, so we'll, we'll push that a little bit later. Yeah. Um, so maybe let's uh, get started with uh, Stan. Thank you very much. So the following two seminars, we have uh, Essie, Peter, uh, Christoph, and Thomas uh, agreed to uh, contribute. So you should uh, make sure to uh, attend. something in class, let's say by SUMI, and then we, we would ask the students to think about the terms. And most of these terms that you find in contemporary discussion uh, do not come with definitions. So you do have to work out the context and to see what people are saying about it. Because, so you, 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 you couldn't very well think about them as if there was a dictionary stipulation. Um, we also think about when we read these texts uh, in terms of keyword clusters because very often although the individual terms are not defined, the clustering gives you the sense of what they are doing with it. The second clue that you may have for working out the sense of the words when there are no definitions is to see which word is being used to attack which word which word is being used to supersede which word. So um, in the 30 years ago, there was a word called event. And this is a, a word used to attack the word meaning or fall. Um, so it is an emergent thing, uh, something of a surprise that you couldn't have foretold entirely. And so it is a, of the order of an event. Um, if you say materiality, it is a word used to attack postmodernism with all the interests in semiotics and meaning. So these words are not neutral, they are knives. So when, when you use the words, we are often listening to see whether you have a sense, when you are not defining the terms, whether you are still in the middle of the action or whether you are out of it. Words like program and materiality are words that are weapons. They are used to attack the postmodernists. Kuhas used programming and uh, Hudson de Meron used uh, materiality. Uh, when these words travel to mainland China, they usually lose the context of discussion, which means that the words circulate, but the action is missing. Um, so if you, for instance, mix mainland Chinese case studies uh, with Western case studies, like my students are doing this week, um, something has to be hedged so that you don't blur the business. So here we're showing you some clustering of terms. They're not what you would find in week four here. 
But the, the idea of clustering is what is still relevant to you. Uh, so sometimes the, the, the keyword clusters are used to think about actual cases too, and you find clustering like that. Um, so that's the first thing I want to tell you. Uh, when you. When you use the keywords before you have defined your project, there are specific um, things to do to make it still productive as a way of chatting with your advisor. So nobody is expecting by week four that you know what you are doing. On the other hand, you do want to show that you are, in some sense, coherent. So um, the keywords and the clustering of the keywords and the iterations of the diagrams of these keywords, they are the tools for helping us discuss your work. Um, they externalize your work before you have thought it through. So the, the lesson is really that you should not start diagramming the keywords after you have thought it through, because that's not going to happen right away. So you want to start diagramming the keywords before you have thought it through, and you do it every week in iterations, and you massage it. Now, the, the, the usual ways of clustering the keywords would be to use nouns, and we would expect you in the next 10 days to have lots of nouns. You talk to your advisors almost completely about nouns. This is, uh, to some extent, a waste of time. Um, in the diagramming of the, of the words, you would have clusters, uh, more than one cluster, it's usually three or four clusters. You will start off probably with 20 key terms, and you will be clustering them. Um, you group different things together, and you put them close to each other or further apart. You make the font size larger or smaller. Um, you use color patches um, to, to introduce some sense of differentiation between them. Um, it is also important if you are working with 20 terms to have verbs. Because if you keep chanting nouns to your advisors, after three weeks you will get nowhere. Because you really need verbs to tell people what you are doing. So you are contrasting something, you are summarizing something, you are mixing this with that, you are bringing two things into relationship with each other. These are all verbal articulations. So what we usually find when people don't do well in the first four weeks is that they get obsessed with the nouns and they are not using verbs. And as a result, the jury has no idea what they're up to. So actions that you do must be explicit. They cannot be implied. Uh, so the, the, the students who don't do so well usually articulate the verbs uh, too late in the piece. If you are working with 20 terms, we imagine that there would be some personal names involved. These names need not be famous names like Xiumi or Kuhas. They could be a fairly nameless local Hong Kong person who made a big difference in some respect of a particular locality. Um, the politician who has received the death threat has apparently been studying certain new territories into areas in terms of land usage and, and, and so on. Um, so you may find one or two key names in the last 30 years about one particular bit of Hong Kong that you are interested in. And you may be exploring certain things that they did in terms of strategies they articulated or stumbled upon or that their work has, had implied to you and that you are drawing it out. So usually in the, in the list of 20 terms, you may find anywhere between three to four personal names in there that are crucial for whatever you are doing. They might not be about the, the site that you are interested in, which is the example I used. It could also be uh, someone who, who articulated a particular technique in drawing, um, relating, let's say, um, structural articulations with programmatic articulations. You may find somebody who's done a lot of work in that, and then this person becomes very interesting to you. So if you articulate um, actual names of people, it, it may be uh, useful for starting a conversation with your advisor or with, with your critics in the next four weeks, uh, in the sense that people may recommend extra things to you because you are jogging their memory about relevant uh, people who could be um, doing similar things or complementary things to each other. Um, but for the same reason, uh, very often if you are reading things, like some of you are reading things, um, one or two titles may become significant to you. If, if you are not doing site-specific work, but you are mainly interested in programming or cross-programming, uh, one or two particular publications 
may become important to you. Recently, there is a book called Manual of Sections, which may be pertinent to you if you are dealing with a very slope site on Hong Kong Island. Um, the Manual of Sections is a new book from America, and you can order it online. It comes in about a week, so you can still use it in time. Um, I only know about this because I ordered one for myself a few weeks ago. Um, so so the, the titles are, they are not a bibliography. They, they are something that you are using for a very specific purpose in your own machine of the thing. So you, you are telling people that you have resources. So if you are, let's say, looking at, um, yesterday I was talking to someone about a fishing uh, um, location for fishing. So we, we started thinking about waterfronts and, and so, so you use that, reading around, um, May not it be a book about the program that you are interested in. It may be a book about uh, a secondary association with your project. Um, then the, the, usually people in week four present case studies. Um, yesterday, one of my students, uh, using the Avery Index for the first time probably in his life, um, found a three-page article published in Buenos Aires. So I asked a friend of mine in Harvard to give us a PDF yesterday. Um, but really, a three-page uh, case study is almost useless. And if there's nothing else on this building in Buenos Aires, you might as well drop it. Um, the kind of case studies that we are interested in uh, are like this. So if you study a, a particular building, let's say in four weeks you may study three buildings, um, that's what we are collecting. That's the list. So if you have three pages from an article in Buenos Aires, you can bet your ass you're not going to get these images. So uh, if you have a very limited image archive, it isn't, it's not very good to make a key case study out of it. You kind of, you're just lusting after a building. You're not doing it. Uh, so usually we, we tell the students that you start with 60 to 100 images for the building and then you have a go. Uh, if you don't really have that, like well, one of my students yesterday didn't have that, um, he wanted to study a, a building by Huali in Beijing. Um, so I, I text a student and we got something from them last night. Um, you do have to go to the architect if the building is not well published. So if you have um, Something like this, uh, you get plans, you get sketch plans, you get as many as possible. Um, then you probably will cull the, the whole thing back to 25 to 28 images. And then you have the beginnings of a case study that you can talk about in week four. So we also searched the RIBA library catalog, we searched the Harvard library catalog, we, we scan texts that people find useful for this particular building, so you don't have to do it at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, so that, that's what we do. Uh, after you have the image archived, you do this kind of thing where, where you start clustering the images to make a case for a particular point. Um, the, the, we prefer you not to look at the images one by one. We prefer you to read the relationship between them. Usually in the magazine layouts, they very rarely do this work for you, which is why we have trained the third year students here to, to do this kind of thing. So you're correlating photographs with sections with a detail, uh, and you do this over and over again. It takes you three days from the time, well, it takes you three days to do the image archive and another three days to do this document. So if you are doing four weeks of work and you're showing two case studies in the mid-review, it would take you probably six, six to ten days to do this just by itself. So um, it's, it's not very casual. So we are looking at the correlations of images. And when you can correlate and explain it, that means you got it. Um, so we usually find in eight minutes of uh, mid-review in M2, very short. The, the, the analysis here is 1,200 words. So you can't say this, of course, in front of the jury in week four. But what you can do is to point to one very specific cluster of four images from this case study 
and draw something from it for your project. And you can draw another four cluster of four images from another case study and say what you're learning, like in what direction you're learning. Maybe you're only learning something about the envelope. Maybe you're thinking about the ground treatment and the relationship of the footprint to the ground. Uh, maybe you're thinking about um, some small, smaller aspects of it on, about the program, like that. So, so you can draw very specific things. But the basic skill is really to start from a larger image archive and to zoom in very specifically to specific points of understanding. You will find that the headings that you use in these things, um, like the heading here is Sophis of Balconies. So this is not about a large heading like brickwork or uh, envelope or a, a little vague keyword like that. You, you, you do point to whatever you are interested in and thinking about it. Uh, you can be using the section to discuss how the structure has been hidden too. Say this kind of thing coming down and is a horizontal thing, is a little bit of a magical thing, and uh, it takes a bit of digging to work out how they could have a treatment like that. So uh, it can work for large buildings as well as small buildings and very boutique, high budget buildings. But the basic idea really is to match the images and you are doing two or three kinds of images for every cluster. So usually we find it in the books and the magazines that images have been jumbled up and your job is to scan and to restore the gestalt of the images by matching them and making clusters. In the same way, in the keywords that you make clusters of, you are beginning to make sense of these words by clustering them and making subgroups out of them and putting emphasis on one thing versus another. There are mostly uh, in, the, in the thinking about the keywords, um, people do think about words all the time. It is a pity. Uh, because sometimes key numbers are what will help you work very closely in the week four, week eight segment. Uh, because when you're trying to put ideas into basic arrangements and so uh, the sizing of a column grid, um, a certain thresholds of density that makes one thing work versus another, um, you, you want to have some handle on the numbers. And in the sources that you deal with, uh, very often there are numbers. Uh, all, a lot of our students look at plans and sections as if they are diagrams uh, rather than scale drawings. But those drawings actually have numbers, right? Uh, so you can probably learn something from the numbers. It would be very surprising in the medium to larger scale projects uh, where in the conceptualization of a project uh, key numbers are totally absent and apparently irrelevant. It would help us believe in you more if every now and then a certain bit of key numbering is presented to us. Um, the keywords and the key numbers and the case studies, the personal names of people you are interested in, the titles of books or articles, um, names of buildings, these are the ingredients making up a list of 20, which will be clustered more or less um, into smaller clusters and presented as a diagram. So you would do this uh, probably three or four times with your advisor between now and the first mid-review, I imagine. Um, some advisors put more emphasis on this. Some advisors think other aspects are more important. It depends on what you're working on. Uh, to the extent that the project is larger scale or more complex, the diagram is probably more useful. If you're doing something like 200 square meters, um, the diagramming is not going to be so, so crucial. So you, you, can, you can hedge around. I imagine that mostly you can try it and see whether it really is something that will help you and your advisor to have a chat about something. Um, the, the diagrams are not, not self-sufficient self sheets. There is a spiel that you, you, you put next to it. You're talking to someone and explaining how these things are clustered and why you pick out certain things as more important relative to others. Right? So you always imagine 
at the back of your head some little voice talking about the diagram and making sense of it for someone else. And that's more or less what you are doing in week four. The keywords are tied to key understandings, and the key understandings are generally written about. There are specific reference tools that help you, and I've listed two of them. Um, they are not the, the most useful, but, but we, we have them. That's the thing. Columbia University put out a, a book of keywords associated with their studio handouts some years ago. I think we have it upstairs. Uh, Patrick has a copy of it, I think. Um, so uh, you can find things like that. But what what um, I want to emphasize in front of you is that when there are no definitions for particular words that you are interested in, like the word program is not very easily defined, um, usually you, you read and you look for a particular formula. This is a, the Americans do this quite a lot. And they always say, it's this and not that. And the, the text repeatedly announced, this and not that, is this and not that. When you grab more and more of these formulations, you get a better sense of the word. So, so you always uh, look for this locution, this and not that. And everyone from Eisenman afterwards seems to be doing this. The, the keywords, um, we think that so far you're doing one list of keywords with clusterings. But in fact, there are also uh, more specific clusterings of keywords for particular domains of study. And since uh, site analyses are not very well published, um, I want to say a few words about that. Um, in, in architectural publications, people very rarely publish site analyses. They publish the end product, they don't publish the beginnings of, of, of the project. So you don't get to see the sorts of uh, images and drawings that architects make in the front <coughs> side of the thing, even before the schematic design. Uh, they are already drawing and talking and gathering stuff. But that material is almost never published. So for this reason, we uh, took um, undergraduate students to 20 firms in Sydney one year. And we made each firm explain two case studies to them in terms of site analysis. We, we did voice recordings, and we told the first years to listen to the voice recordings and work out what were the key terms of the site analysis. Some words were used by the architects explicitly. Some words were implied by them, but never uttered in so many words. So the students would come up with two lists, the explicit list of keywords for site analysis and the implicit list of keywords. And then they were asked to basically write a blurb explaining what they understood of the four particular keywords based on the voice recordings that they made. So. Um, Here's an example, right? Uh, so for a very expensive house in Double Bay in Sydney, right on the waterfront, um, apparently if you uh, block the views of your neighbor by anything like 2%, um, they, they sue you in court and delay your project. So the site analysis that people do has to be extremely precise because a little bit will land you in court. Um, and there are these keywords that the students found for particular things in the voice recording. And the words in gray are the, the words that the students thought implied. So here's a second example. So if you gather this material for 20 architects, you get 40 buildings. And then the 40 buildings are between small scale domestic work to large tall buildings in the Middle East or something like that. So you will see that um, in the design studios usually, people use barely 5% of the keywords for site analysis that we actually see working in the field in actual offices. So uh, in other words, it also explains to us why the, the first four weeks in the studio is so often not very useful is because they, they are not talking about the site analysis in professional terms. They're using 5% of the words. So can you imagine a, a medical doctor using 5% of the medical terms and trying to run a business? 
the 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 the